Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Allison Schilling, the Manager of Public Programs here at the Concord Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's film screening and conversation on the making of Joe Wheeler, a Concord story, which is one of the programs we're offering in conjunction with our new temporary exhibition, Home Paintings by Loring W. Coleman. In 2017, the Concord Museum received an anonymous gift of 47 works of art by Lauren Coleman. Visitors can see a selection of the works displayed in the museum's Wallace Kane Gallery through the month of January. This exhibition celebrates the work of an accomplished watercolor artist with a strong Concord connection and who explored New England with a sense of wonder and authenticity. You will hear tonight from Joe Wheeler and Steve Verrill, who also share deep and meaningful connections to Concord farm life. Lauren Coleman similarly hearkens to a childhood spent on his grandparents' Concord farm through his paintings of an agrarian New England. The paintings are really spectacular to experience in person, so I hope you can visit the museum soon to see them. We will begin this evening's program by showing a film made by Susan Orleans Reader on the life of Joe Wheeler, who was born on Thoreau Farm in 1926 and went on to help farmers and others across the world. At the end of his career, he returned home to Concord. After the screening, we're lucky to have a conversation over Zoom with Joe Wheeler himself and his daughter Rachel, filmmaker Sue Ryder, Sue Reader, and Barrel Farm co-owner Steve Barrel. They will have a brief conversation moderated by Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director of the Concord Museum. We hope you will join us again next week for a forum with historian Mary Beth Norton on her new book, 1774, The Long Year of Revolution, followed by the national unveiling of the Concord Museum's new Shot Heard Around the World microsite that uses artifacts and multimedia animations to bring the story of the iconic events of April 19, 1775 to life. Tonight's program is free and open to all, and we are so grateful to all of those who donated during the registration. Your gift directly supports these programs that bring engaging and educational experiences to your homes. And if you enjoy tonight's program and wish to make a contribution, there's a link in the description on YouTube. Thank you. I hope you enjoy tonight's program. I believe that each of us as citizens, not only of our community, our state, and our country, but also as citizens of the world, it's important that we recognize that humankind is having an impact on the world, which could very well lead to a deterioration of our environment such that it would no longer be hospitable to the human race. Now that's a very long-term point of view, but I think the long-term is made up of hundreds and thousands of short-terms, <laughs> and we need to keep the long-term perspective in mind. My name is Joseph Wheeler. I was born in Concord, Massachusetts, on a dairy farm on Virginia Road, it happened to be the farm where Henry David Thoreau was born about 200 years ago. Joe Wheeler is really one of my favorite Concord heroes of the present time. He spent a good deal of his working life overseas in very exotic places. The thing that's so interesting about him is the values that he grew up with in Concord, being a child of the Depression at a time when people really needed to embrace other people and look out for the community as a whole. These are the very same values that he took across the sea. My father was really brought up with the idea that 
Everybody has a responsibility to make the world a better place. He has always spoken of all the people of the world as equal citizens. We were made to be aware of all the different ways in which people could live their lives. When he was in his early 80s, my father lost his vision. I think many people would have just given up. This ability to persevere through difficulties and maintain an optimistic outlook on life is really central to who he is as a person. I was born in 1926, November 21, and I was the fourth son of Caleb Henry Wheeler and Ruth Robinson Wheeler. Caleb was a ninth generation Concordian. Ruth Wheeler, my mother, came from Watertown, Massachusetts, but she spent her summers in Concord and enjoyed picking blueberries and being out on the Concord River and enjoyed the company of the local boys, including my father, who was the son of a long line of farmers. Thorough Farm was a wonderful way for me to grow up. Thorough Farm is located on Virginia Road in the east quarter of Concord. It's called Thorough Farm because that's where the house was when Thorough was born in it. The house got moved up the street in 1883 or 85. I was born in the house that replaced the house that Thoreau was born in. As I say, I was born in the same airspace. If you ask my father about religion, that sometimes he would say that he was a transcendentalist. Certainly, I was brought up from an early age knowing that there were these writers in Concord who talked about God or the divine being in everything, who talked about experiencing transcendental moments through being in nature. And that was something that made a lot of sense to me. I was one of five boys on a farm, about an 80-acre farm here in Concord. My folks had moved to the farm in 1916, and uh, we had a wonderful family. We were all given the opportunity to work on the farm as soon as we were able. My father became a dairy farmer in 1916. That was a time when dairy farming was big business in Concord. In Virginia Road, where I lived, we had six dairy farms on that road alone. And there were lots of other dairy farms in the town. Dairy farming came to Concord in a big way after the railroad came through Concord. So the railroad came through in 1844 and it instantly changed the way that farmers farmed. They had farmed the heavy crops, the old staples previously. But now they could think of a market that was not a local market. They could think of a market that was Boston. They could get things in there that they couldn't have considered getting in there before. So there was a movement away from the old crops toward small fruits and delicate crops like asparagus. And there was dairy farming as well. And so if you look through the assessor's records for Concord in the late 19th century, and you look at particular Concord farmers, one of the columns that's listed is the number of cattle that they have. And you can see that number going up toward the end of the century. Dairy farming persisted well into the 20th century. I would say maybe the 1950s was the time when it started to decline. As the years went by, dairy farming went out of style in Concord because it just wasn't economic. The dairy industry declined in the area uh, for a number of reasons as time went on. And some of the dairy farms would switch over to doing produce for the Boston market. The way that we buy and sell and transport things has changed so much that 
the market became a much bigger market and the local didn't matter so much and even the regional didn't matter so much. The Wheelers were doing dairy farming over on Virginia Road at what was still a pretty good moment. Today, 90 years later, I'm not aware of any dairy cow in Concord. There were thousands uh, when my father went into the business and he managed to get into the business just at a time when it was on a downhill track. <laughs> uh, my father talks about growing up on a farm as a very idyllic childhood, although when you get into the stories about it, it was actually a lot of hard work and entrepreneurship that sometimes was successful and sometimes was devastating. I think that he did take that with him in his later work in aid for agriculture overseas. He had a real sense of the difference that a canal, for instance, might make to small farmers along the route of the canal in Jordan, or to the difference that a new variety of wheat might make to farmers struggling to feed their families on a tiny little plot of land in Pakistan. When he was working in various other countries, Pakistan and so forth, the fact that he had grown up on a farm gave him a perspective and also a human connection to the people that he was assisting with farm improvement and so forth. And that, I think, is very important. The farm was not a flat surface. It was hills and swamps and meadows and good agricultural land and some land that was not very good. Good farmland is very important. One of my most memorable uh, field trips at Cornell was the farm appraisal trip with our professor. And all of the farms were in very poor condition. The buildings were falling down, there were weeds growing up in the machinery out in the field. and very discouraging and we just drove over the hill and everything was beautiful and new machinery painted buildings nice neat fields and the difference was the type of soil that's why agriculture has done so well in Concord because we do have some of the great soils my grandfather Caleb was interested in the science of caring for the land, improving the quality of his cattle herd. Concord is a place where there's actually meetings of the local farmers with minutes about the latest scientific advances. I really enjoyed the farm. Some of my enjoyment was in the picking of things that were free. I knew where to pick the blackberries, the blueberries, and the grapes. In September, I would go and get a great big bag of cranberries from a cranberry bog that was otherwise unused. I have a memory in those days of the flowers. In the spring, we had Rhodora, which grew on a swampy area across the road from the house. The Rhodora was made famous by Emerson in his poem. Then I remember fringed gentian and pussy willows, skunk cabbage, and hawthorn bush, and so forth. Each had its place on the farm. It was an important thing for the Wheeler family to know when things were going to be flowering or when they were going to be ripening. Joe has talked about being interested in bloom time. In this, he is following in a Concord tradition that really started with Henry David Thoreau, who kept unbelievable records of the first blooming of all kinds of plants in Concord. This is something Joe would have grown up familiar with. In his concern with other countries, he was very attuned to the idea of looking at environmental issues and how they affected people's lives. These days, scholars, scientists are very interested in Thoreau. They're studying the bloom times to determine how global warming is taking effect. I think of the farm, I've called it a dairy farm, but from the point of view of us boys, 
it was very much a place where we got our hands dirty in our own field. We had the cash crops, the strawberries, asparagus, the raspberries. This was important because we needed the money in the spring to pay the taxes and buy the seed to get things started for the new agricultural year. I will say a few words about money, even though in New England families it's considered quite inappropriate. Here's a boy who grew up on a farm with no cash. In the early years of our family life as five kids, things were also very tight. So my father has always been somebody who could be thrifty in the moment with all the small details of how to do things, but at the same time turn around and be incredibly generous and give when somebody really needs it. A strong sense of community is something that I consider characteristic of Concord. Farmers rely on one another. There are wonderful stories about the farmers at Nine Acre Corner who were also wheelers, who would take turns driving each other's produce to market in Boston. They needed to rely on one another. Life was hard, and so you, you, you formed the community. Plus, in Nine Acre Corner, they were all married to one another, so it was a natural community as, as well. I do think that the Depression made a big difference. People who grew up during the Depression, it's a common story that you band together, either within the family or you know, within the larger community to make sure that the people who are most at risk are not hurting. It was a moment that really sort of fit together with Joe's family upbringing and the sort of the, the traditional New England values to encourage what he became. During the uh, 30s, I think, we had an ice house used for cooling the milk in the summer. There's a Wheeler ice house about a foot from my property line that still exists minus its roof. It has 18-inch uh, walls, approximately, of concrete blocks. And I remember, I couldn't have been more than five years old probably, I can remember seeing blocks of ice packed in sawdust being stored in there. Uh, that was just one year. Uh, after that, they were through the ice and uh, it became a pig pen. They had pigs in there. <laughs> you know, there were people who were very good at cutting ice on the local ponds. There was Walden Pond and White Pond, McCone's Pond and so forth. We could harvest ice, load it onto a truck and bring it in. After packing that ice away in the ice house, we had to carry the ice across the yard to the milk room and use it as what we hoped was an inexpensive way of cooling the milk before we sent it off to market in the morning. I do remember the Iceman coming around for some years because some people still had uh, ice boxes for a refrigerator. At the beginning, we had an ice box. Every week, the Iceman came. We had a sign that we put in the window telling how many pounds we wanted. He would come in with his ice over his shoulder with a, a leather pad on his back because of the melting ice. In our house, we'd moved up. We had uh, something you don't see very often now is a, a gas refrigerator. When I was very young, we still worked with horses. I lived through the conversion from horse traction to tract attraction that took place in the 1930s. The way to get to school was a horse-drawn barge, as it was called. Even later on, the motorized school bus was called the barge. It was a square metal bus. In those days, the drivers owned the buses. I can recall when I was about 10 or 12, we had a farm downtown 
which has now been developed into a shopping area. But we grew silage corn down there, and we would bring two loads home each day. One day, I was given the responsibility of sitting up there on top of the load, managing the two-horse team and getting it home. Fortunately, those horses knew the way. It was Joe Wheeler growing up. Later on, I used to run the A horse with a hay rake, even a cultivator. That was all just before we got our John Deere tractor. John Deere tractor without an automatic starter. I remember it had a wheel that we had to move around, and it didn't always start. There was a good deal of cursing and concern as we tried to get that tractor to go. Just like a reluctant horse, we got it going. We went into the more modern period. I personally always grew something. At the age of 10, I was growing nasturtiums, and I exhibited them at the Acton Fair, which took place every fall. At the fairs I'd been to, I won my way to show at the Eastern States Exposition, which was the goal of everybody at all of the fairs. And I got a third prize on my nasturtiums and felt very proud. <laughs> but later on, I managed an acre of garden and with all of the crops that one grows for a big family that needs to produce as much as possible. And uh, I came away with big bundles of ribbons for this and that and enjoyed the process. <laughs> that was one of my 4-H club projects. Another project was my chickens. Back in 1938 in Concord, we had the hurricane. Of course, the whole state had the hurricane. But I took my bike downtown and took pictures of all the trees on Main Street that had fallen over the road. We lost so many elm trees at that time. But in the woods, we lost a lot of pines. My father decided that we could harvest the big trees that had fallen and make a brooder house. So we did, we got a plan from the Department of Agriculture Extension Service in Concord. We built a brooder house from hurricane lumber. I was able to buy baby chicks and bring them up to be good laying hens. We had a disaster in the dairy business during the 30s. The state of Massachusetts came and tested our cows. They decided that our cows were carrying tuberculosis. Cows were tested annually for tuberculosis and brucellosis. In either case, a significant problem in the herd, the herd would be destroyed. And that did take numerous herds across the state. One of the ways of Fighting tuberculosis among people was to fight it among animals. When they found an animal had tuberculosis, you had to sell it to be slaughtered and start over again after leaving the farm without any cows for a year. Well, my mother and father had that year to think about what they were going to do next, and they decided that they would shift from Holsteins and miscellaneous kinds of cows and go into a purebred system of Ayrshires. Ayrshires are a beautiful cow, red and white, and they came from Scotland. In order to improve the breeding, my folks decided that they would get a bull calf from a very fine farm down in Pennsylvania, Penshurst. We ordered this bull calf that was called Man of War 29. I found in among my folks' papers a telegram that came saying that Man of War 29 will be on the train coming into the South Station. That meant that we had to warm up our truck. 
and go and fetch that bull calf. That was the bull calf, because it later grew into the bull that, alas, uh, uh, gored my mother. Ruth got severely injured by a, a bull that she thought was a good friend of hers and turned out not to be. Apparently, my mother decided she was going to get the bull back into the barn, and uh, the bull gored her. She was in the hospital for quite some period of time. It has an impact to say my grandmother is the kind of person who was gored by a bull. <laughs> Grandma could be a pretty tough woman, and the story of being gored by a bull, which she later minimized quite a bit, is part of the legend of who she was. I have a memory of my mother on top of the hay load, making the load. The boys and my father would get hay and put forkfuls up on the load, and my mother would be placing those forkfuls in such a way that the forkfuls would bind each other and keep the load from falling off. When we backed up the load to the barn, someone would pitch the hay onto the lower mow. It would be passed up the line, and I would be at the top of the mow stuffing it down under the roof. It was very participatory in the Huila family. I have a great feeling of nostalgia for the farm. We brothers and my father and my mother, we worked together. It is a seven day a week endeavor for the most part, especially when we had the dairy herd. When we were milking cows the last 10 or 20 years, we were milking 150 cows three times a day. So from midnight to 4 a.m. was about the only time there wasn't something active going on in the farm. My father did the milking twice a day, in principle, 365 days of the year. It was hard work, and uh, he did this from 1916 to 1953. My mother was a very busy person, as you can imagine, with five boys. I really respected her for that. Mondays were a wash day, and she had a sort of a tumbler washer. She had a lot of wash to do. And I can remember on a really cold day in February, <laughs> she would go out with this big load of wash and hang it all up. As she was hanging it up, it froze. And I could imagine how her fingers were feeling because she had to maneuver this clothespins without any gloves on. And on Tuesday morning, she stood there in the kitchen with the ironing board. And it was interesting to me that when the boys started going off to college, the system was that you sent your dirty clothes back to your mother to be washed. So my mother didn't even get rid of the washing when she sent her kids off to college. We were on a very limited budget, and she reflected that, doing so much of the work herself. One of the things that I think is unique about my father's family is they brought up those five sons on a farm, understanding and commitment that they were going to send those five sons to college. Although the daily work was getting the cows milked and getting the hay cut, there was always an awareness within the family of the larger world around them and potential connections to that world. Concord is a very unique place to grow up. This is a town with a very deep sense of history, of leadership, of intellectual traditions. Ruth, my grandmother, was particularly involved. 
She was a real powerhouse of intellectual curiosity. It was rare in her era to be college educated. I was very much influenced by my family. My mother was very special. She was a good farmer's wife, but it wasn't enough to satisfy her. She was educated at Vassar and spent a year in Germany and came back to be a teacher of German. But at the time of the First World War, interest in German, as you can imagine, was lost to the American people. His mother was involved in historic research and connections with intellectual people in the community. She was very interested in civic affairs. She was one of the first women to be appointed to a town committee. She wrote a book called Conquered Climate for Freedom. I remember my mother conversing with Ruth and she was uh, very much a presence related to the Concord Journal. She ended up writing over a hundred stories of an historic nature for the Concord Journal. Her sister had become the owner of Fairhaven Woods. My mother persuaded her sister to the advantages of giving those woods to the Concord Land Conservation Trust. So she was a feminist and that is an issue that I was encouraged to be interested in. All of these things together, the farming, her interest in women's participation in politics, and the local interest in the environment all went together to encourage my interests in economic development. Ruth Robinson Wheeler, Joe's mother, was a very strong-minded woman, a very well-educated woman for her time a highly principled woman with deep values, and those values were to some extent New England values, traditional New England values. You place a lot of emphasis on democracy and everybody's responsibility to consider the whole rather than just the individual. Also, there's a sense of common responsibility that a farm engenders. Joe's mother had a much broader worldview than probably a lot of people in Concord at the time. Joe grew up both with that sense of responsibility, but also that sense that the world is bigger than Concord, Massachusetts. My father's parents really taught their sons that it was important to be involved in the world. I think that that had a big influence on my father's idealism. At the same time, there remains the problem of how you actually make changes in the world. And that's a much more practical day-to-day -day task of trying to organize other people together. And it's really at that organizational level that my father focused his career. Like most towns in the United States, Concord was a very different place during the war years. And every family in my father's cohort, older brothers were off fighting in the war. Kids who were not yet 18 were thinking about their likely future service. Education was accelerated. Fewer people were home to do the work of the farm news was coming back of people who had been killed in action. I think that it did also bring the community together in many ways with an understanding that families needed to help each other out. Well, when World War II started, I was 13. So during the war, I finally became of military age in 1945. By that time, the war was just about over. I did enlist and went into the Army Air Corps. I was let out after only seven months in the service. My father had three older brothers and World War II touched 
the family through each of them in different ways. So the world was very present during his formative high school and college years. Now in my family, we had a very diverse approach to the military. My eldest brother became a Quaker and he was a conscientious subjector. He just felt that it was always wrong to kill. Whereas I thought that the Nazi situation was so terrible that we had to stop it. My second brother had weak eyes and could not be in the military, but he volunteered for the American Field Service Ambulance Corps and went to North Africa. My third brother joined the Army Air Corps and he was killed flying over Hungary in 1944. My younger brother, who came after World War II, was in the military in Korea. Well, World War II was a time of austerity, of course, and so we had rationing. We learned to cook with less butter and to eat less meat. I found that housewives wanted my old hands. His chickens were known for having a lot of fat, which was a very popular substitute for butter fat in cooking during the World War II years. One year, I grew a couple of pigs, and these were part of the process of providing meat to the family during the time of great shortage during the war. We did much more home gardening. Everybody was growing a uh, victory garden, including our family. There was a family in Concord named Verrill that had a dairy farm, and they decided at the beginning of the war that they would, first of all, process milk and deliver it locally, and we decided to sell to Verrill. Then they decided that they would develop a freezer room with lockers. Frozen food was just coming in then as being a viable way of preserving food, but there weren't many home-type freezers that hadn't been developed. People could hire a locker, and that way they could buy a side of beef or a pig. Everybody thought of ways that they could improve their diets during the war. I can remember going into the locker to get something for my mother. Boy, it was cold. <laughs> but it was very useful. During the war, when I was in grammar school, we'd have these, uh, I guess you'd call them propaganda movies, that down in the auditorium. They were really horrific war movies showing things that they'd never show in the schools nowadays. Well, during the war, I remember the air raids we used to have where fire whistle would blow the air raid signal. You'd have to pull your shades down and keep lights turned off. Like every community in the eastern seaboard, we doused our lights at night in case there would be bombardment. We didn't want to indicate where the urban areas were. My father was asked to be a warden to go up and down the street to make sure that the lights from houses were properly obscured with curtains and so forth. Automobiles, to the extent that they were used at night and they weren't used much, the headlights were painted partly black in order to cut down the amount of light that would shine. I had friends who went up to the top of Nashotic Hill to watch for enemy planes. That meant that they had to learn what those planes looked like. We had very little gasoline, and so we made many less trips and we didn't make long trips. We were saving all kinds of metals for recycling, all the tin cans from food, and even toothpaste tubes. I think they must have had lead in them at those days, and that was saved to, I presume, going to making ammunition. We had the saving stamp program. 
where kids had these stamp books and you'd buy stamps from the teachers that would be traded in for a $25 war bond. Another thing everybody did. There were a lot of uh, special efforts made by people in Concord. There were bundles for Britain, care packages. Everybody was making a maximum effort to be a participant in the war once we were in it. I've heard that one of the reasons that the U.S. was successful in World War II was because there were so many farm boys in the Army and they were experienced in knowing how to deal with unforeseen circumstances and if a machine broke, they would figure a way to fix it if they didn't have the right part or whatever. There was a wonderful old material we used to use called baling wire. <laughs> you could wire most anything together with that and that came into slang eventually as being a, just a makeshift thing, but it made things work. During World War II, there were uh, two things. There was a shortage of farm labor because all the young men had gone into the army and uh, we also had German prisoners that were being held at Fort Devens and they worked out a system so that these prisoners could be bussed out to the crop farms and help weed and harvest the crops during the growing season to keep the food supply coming and I expect it kept them a little easier to handle too with a little outdoor activity. There was a big farm run by a, a corporation called Andy Boy in Concord in the Nine Acre Corner area. Andy Boy had access to prisoners of war. He would use these soldiers who had been captured as farm workers. I thought it was quite exciting as a youngster. Again, I would have been uh, probably 10, 12 years old and there'd be one interpreter with a group and he typically didn't work he in the field. He sat along the edge of the field and interpreted when he needed to. And I used to visit with him and it was kind of exciting for a youngster in those days. Learned that they were people too and they had families at home. After the war, my wife and I visited Germany and I remember stopping at a place where we could taste some wine and there was a German proprietor and he said, ah, you're from America. I was a prisoner and it was wonderful and he loves Americans. It was heartwarming to meet people who had been subjected to our discipline. My parents both spoke about World War II as something that must never happen again. There was a real interest in trying to change the world. Clearly that meant not only developing international organizations, but also doing something about the economic disparities in the world. I was talking with my father recently about his older brother, Henry. And one of the things that Henry did for Joe was to send him off to a conference in the Poconos. Between my freshman and sophomore years in high school, my older brother, who was a Quaker, decided to give me a scholarship. I remember it as being $20, and it was a scholarship to attend a Quaker seminar in the Poconos for a week or so. Henry had a knack throughout his lifetime for small actions that really changed the course of people's lives. And my father identifies that time when he went off to this conference as something that really was pivotal. Um, among the people he met there was Harris Wofford, who later became a U.S. Senator. and. He and Harris Wofford worked very closely together uh, on, on and off for a number of years in the Student Federalists. 
The Federalists were working to develop the framework essentially for a world government that would use international agreements and negotiations in place of wars. That sent my father off to international conferences in Europe after World War II. So it really broadened his perspective in very important ways. Growing up in the middle of a world war uh, with parents who had been very deeply affected by the First World War, the appeal of another way of doing things was obvious and to a teenager, it maybe didn't seem impossible. World War II created the moment in which Joe could become the person that he became. After the war was over and Europe was devastated, the United States started initiatives to contribute to European recovery. So you had the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s. In that particular moment, there's an opportunity for idealism of a particular kind to flourish. It's a practical idealism. You have to be able to figure out how to help people in practical ways, but the impulse is idealistic. Going forward with the development of USAID and the Peace Corps as well, the idea that there's a responsibility to think more globally, to contribute to global well being. Joe was there and Joe saw an opportunity to apply the values that he had been raised with. And so in my sophomore year in high school, on Sunday afternoons, we would meet in an empty store on the mill dam in Concord and talk about our vision of a way for the world to get together and prevent future wars. We were pretty naive but we learned a whole lot, and our interest in international affairs was stimulated in this way. As a result, I found myself in later years wanting to take the courses which would lead to a career in international relations. My father started at Bowdoin College in 1944 at the end of his junior year in high school. At the end of his college years, he applied for a scholarship offered by the Boston Globe for international study abroad and was one of 10 recipients. My father still had the problem of how to get over to Europe. I was looking for the cheapest way of getting to Europe. After some investigation, he found that he could get a job on a ship that was transporting horses to Europe. I met the, the ship in Montreal and was part of the farmer's crew feeding the horses, working on the front end of the horses, <laughs> glad to say. I think there were 852 horses on this victory ship. That was part of feeding Europe, actually. In Europe in those days, they were slaughtering horses for food. I was paid $35 for as, as a farm laborer. Uh, and, and that was a good start to my European trip. One of the other recipients of the Globe Scholarship was my mother, Jean Hewlett. My father was aware that she was going to study in Geneva. He also was planning to study in Geneva, so he wrote a very sweet letter saying he'd like to introduce himself and perhaps they could meet. By the time they arrived in Geneva, they were already quite close to each other. My parents arrived in Geneva in September. By November, they had decided to announce their marriage. It was a wonderful year in Geneva. We married in February 1949. We came back for graduate study at Harvard, and after that moved to Washington and had the first of five children, Juliet, Rachel, Deborah, Caleb, and Daniel. It was a wonderful family experience. My mother and father had five children in six years. 
this was, to my surprise, not so unusual among my mother's Radcliffe cohort, uh, these young women who graduated with this tremendous education in the early years after World War II just really took to having large families. One of the really unusual things in my childhood was the way that my parents shared uh, family responsibilities. My mother was working on writing her PhD thesis during the years when I was a small child. My father would get the five kids up, feed us breakfast, which always consisted of a hot cereal and a poached egg on toast, and make sure that we got dressed and off to school. We didn't know any other fathers who would consider doing such a thing. We lived in different suburbs of Washington. We spent a couple of years overseas in Jordan in the mid 19. 60s. In 1969, just as my older sister and I were ready to go off to college, we were on a family trip and were involved in a car accident. And in that accident, my mother and my youngest brother died. We had a terrible automobile accident and I lost my first wife and uh, a son my youngest son, Daniel. It was a terrible time for our family. My mother, my father, and my younger siblings were supposed to be going to Pakistan, where my father was going to be director of the foreign aid program. When my father arrived with two teenage children, in Pakistan, the embassy gave some thought to what his needs would be. There was a woman named Verona. She was assigned to assist him with household management duties that would ordinarily fall to the wife of the mission director. She and my father fell in love. And we had a 40-year marriage. Verona had two children who were born and brought up in, in Pakistan. They had a wedding at Christmas time so that all of the four Wheeler children and Verona's two children could attend the wedding. We all went out to Pakistan. Dad and Verona went off for a couple of days of honeymoon by themselves and then had the second honeymoon where we went to the Valley of Swat with six kids and also my grandmother, Juliet. So the mother-in-law of the first wife. This was not your typical honeymoon. <laughs> but it was quite typical of my father to want to be inclusive of everybody. My father worked for the American Foreign Aid Program for the vast majority of his career. After he left USAID, he worked for a variety of different international organizations on some of the same issues. He was clear that he wanted to return to his hometown when he did retire, and he very quickly looked for organizations in Concord that he could become involved with settling on uh, some related to historic preservation, to Thoreau. In my work, I discovered that working together with people in other countries, we could actually accomplish concrete things. Visiting with farmers in Pakistan or in Jordan, I discovered I had something in common with them, and I sort of understood how they thought and the kinds of challenges that they had, the processes that they had to go through to make a living. All of these experiences were made more interesting to me because of the specific experience that I had on Thoreau Farm. My father was very committed to the idea of building a world 
in which countries cooperated and helped each other and very committed to the ideal of helping people who lived in poverty to improve their lives. He had the advantage of working over time with a number of people who led huge technological advances in different fields, including Norman Borlaug, who was a real hero of his and was responsible for much of the Green Revolution science. Jim Grant, who recognized that children were dying by the millions every month around the world from very easily preventable and treatable childhood conditions and pushed to have a movement to get children immunized, get them proper nutrition, and get oral rehydration salts out there for children with diarrheal illnesses. The timing of his career coincided with the availability of new methods of contraception so that real work in family planning was possible. His particular contribution was in working on how to get these advances out to the populations by working with different governments to develop programs that would translate these scientific advances into real differences in people's lives. I think Joe's attachment to the word world citizenship is a reflection of everything that he's believed and has practiced. Joe's work is important because directing our talents and our concern for other people outward is a value, a cultural value, and Joe has basically done that his entire life. He has taken concern for people beyond the people that we know and has done his best to make their lives better. Sometimes I was building a dam or carrying on a major health program in which we eventually got rid of smallpox around the whole world. I was very much involved in the Green Revolution, particularly in Pakistan, where we were able to more than double the wheat production. That, in turn, brought a much better life to the people of Pakistan. I just felt as if we had achieved something of great importance in the use of their land and their water and their farmer's skills to improve the life of the families of Pakistan. I had a very exciting time as acting Peace Corps representative in India. I was there for several months during the first two years of the Peace Corps. Step by step, we were developing the policies for other Peace Corps who went along. And uh, I think that's been a very successful program. Not simply because Peace Corps volunteers help people in other countries, but also because it caused these Americans, men and women, to have an experience which changed their lives and made their careers much more pointed and productive. After I finished my career in USAID, I had an opportunity to work in the United Nations Environment Program at the International Headquarters, being in Nairobi. I think that that little program did the work which eventually led to concerns about climate change. The climate change concerns today didn't grow suddenly overnight, but rather it was a result of a process. I was involved in the population question. We were concerned about rapid population growth. I was born in 1926, and that time uh, the population of the world was about 2 billion. And now it is approaching 8 billion. That's twice doubling during one lifetime. Of course, that can't continue. And what we've discovered is that a very important element here is the role of women. Step by step, we've seen countries around the world paying more attention to girls' education and to children's health. These programs, as they have gradually worked their way out into the countryside and so forth, have changed the 
attitudes to a number of children that people will have. If we can get down to two children per woman during a lifetime, that will bring a stability to world population. And this is, of course, not unrelated to the question of use of resources and the possibilities of significant global warming. In my time in Concord, I learned the set of values which start out with the notion that every human being is a brother or sister. This was a town where the abolitionist movement was very active. This is a town where women began to play a more important role in society. By the time I came along, these were values that were very Concordian. I think that I carried those values into my work. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this such a wonderful and touching film. Uh, we're going to have a discussion now. Uh, you can see uh, Joe Wheeler is here with us uh, with his daughter Rachel uh, by his side. And uh, we have Steve Barrel, although he's not wearing the handsome hat that he had on in the film. Uh, and uh, the actual filmmaker is here with us, Sue Reeder. And Sue, I wanted to first compliment you on such a lovely, lovely and touching film. Uh, I was thinking, um, I hope the audience all understands that uh, we kind of connected this film to a lovely exhibit that we have uh, on display right now of, of these beautiful landscape paintings uh, by Lauren Coleman. And that made me think, you know, there's the artist and there's the subject. Lauren Coleman had these beautiful agrarian landscapes that were so moving to him, but then he captured them uh, in watercolor. And Sue, you do such a lovely uh, job with the documentary films that you make. Uh, you, of course, have wonderful subjects to work with, um, but our hats off to you for bringing them to life and telling them uh, their stories. So maybe just, um, I know you want to make a few opening comments as well, but then uh, just explain to us when you first met Mr. Wheeler and what made you decide to do this film. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Tom, for having us all here this evening and for screening the film. I'm very grateful and delighted to be here. Um, and yeah, be before I answer that question, I'd like to quickly thank those that were involved in the project, beginning with the Concord Free Public Library and Leslie Perrin Wilson, the former curator of Special Collections. Leslie was really wonderful to work with and I'm also very grateful to the library for making their collection available to me. 
I'd also like to thank the local access television stations, both CCTV and MMN and the Concord Cultural Council. And then there's the very talented Sam Kruger who uh, collaborated with me and hugely contributed to this project. And I have to say he was really good at making those cows look great. <laughs> so um, as far as when, when I first met Joe, um, that was most appropriately at Thoreau's 200th birthday party, which now seems like a very long time ago. He was one of the speakers, and I knew that I wanted to learn more about him. Here was a boy who grew up on a local farm and went on to help farmers and others across the world, and that was an amazing story. He's obviously um, exceedingly knowledgeable and a great storyteller. And... He has this remarkable history and this ability to make Concord's past come alive in a way that's almost poetic at times. So um, it, it was one, wonderful focusing on his life, but I also tend to regard this film in a way as a love letter to Concord. Um, so that there was that too. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment, but uh, uh, Mr. Wheeler, I, uh, Watching it tonight a second time, I was struck by your daughter's Rachel comment about your optimistic nature. Uh, she mentioned it in reference to your loss of sight, but when we hear your life story and uh, the loss of siblings and dear family members, um, you know, you, you face some real tragedies in your life, and yet uh, your daughter complimented you on your very optimistic nature, and just seems to me we're living through a fairly dark time at the moment. And I wondered what, 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 what is it that motivate, m motivated you? And especially you, you face some real intractable problems. Um, uh, I mean, really large problems when you were in Pakistan or India or your work with the UN and Kenya. So um, I thought maybe just an opening question is, what keeps you going? What, what, what allowed you to take on and tackle such large uh, problems and make a difference as you have uh, in your life and your career? Well, I think that I was convinced that we, it, it's really one world with a lot of different circumstances, uh, both within countries and between countries. And uh, so I was very pleased when uh, the United States decided that it was going to have a, a program of assistance to developing countries and uh, became quite interested in India. Uh, yeah. Later on, uh, I uh, was offered the job as a United States Agency for International Development Mission Director in Pakistan. And uh, so that, that was great. That happened just at the time that Rachel here was going on to college. And um, what would you say to young, you know, fewer, Fewer young people are going into careers in public service and careers in international development. What, what would you say to encourage a young person who's considering a career in that area? Well, I think it would be wonderful if they could join the Peace Corps. Uh -huh. Peace Corps gets you, into a, gets you out of the central city uh, into, the, into a farming area and you get to know the society as it really is. And uh, from that, that, that basic training that you get as a high school volunteer, uh, yeah, it seems to me it makes you a much better civil servant later on if you want to go into something like the aid program or right. even the United Nations program. And I'll, I'll ask you one other question, and I'll, I'll turn to some other folks, but uh, it's somewhat similar question. But you know, many have commented that our country seems to have lost that sense of idealism uh, that uh, was so prevalent in the late 1950s and early 60s when you were uh, working, especially kind of launching the beginning of your career. What, what, what can we do to get that back? Um, or, or is there a way you can give us some kind of hope about uh, bringing that sense of, um, uh, you know, the, the ideals that... Uh, helped you to strive uh, you know, to achieve the accomplishments that you achieved? Well, I think we need to uh, recognize that human beings are a species all over the world. 
and uh, not, not just Americans. Uh, and uh, we need to redevelop our relationships with developing countries and European countries, working together in the United Nations and other agencies. We have new, new problems because we're now focusing on environmental problems and we can only deal with those issues on an international basis. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Verrill, I was thinking that uh, maybe the sequel of this film should be The Life of Steve Verrill, uh, because you are also legendary in this town. Um, and this, because of this family farm that uh, you and your wife and family have run for now, I believe you recently celebrated the 100th anniversary of the farm. Maybe just tell us what is it about your farm that's, that uh, survived when so many others um, you know, have uh, vanished from the uh, conquered scene? Um, I know I had one thought passed through and it's gone now, but uh, <laughs> it was very clever too. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I talk about farming as being uh, like crossing Sunday River up in Maine, which uh, is a little mountain river with a lot of stones, and you kind of hop from stone to stone. You don't know what your next step's going to be, but you know you get across, and hopefully without getting your feet wet. And uh, that's kind of the way farming is. You solve new problems as they come along, and they do most every day. And uh, <laughs> you mentioned being an optimist, and I think I am too. And maybe part of it's because I feel we can solve most problems that come in a way. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I just always loved the land, and it started, I guess, when I was a little kid, I had a pet calf, and uh, my parents were reading books on soil conservation and so on, and I ended up using them for book reports in school and learned the lessons that kind of stuck with me. And uh, we were talking before, the, um, uh, before we actually started live. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your relationship to the Wheeler family and how you knew Mr. Wheeler when you were younger. Well, I, I don't know if I actually knew Joe very much when I was younger. Uh, you mentioned some tragedy. My oldest uh, brother married his son's widow after he was killed during the war. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a little bit of a distant tie there, but... Um, we were good friends with Betty Madison, who was Ruth's, one of Ruth's best friends and fellow Ashier Razor. And, um, I remember very distinctly when the bull incident happened. Uh -huh. um, I don't know the, uh, I'm not sure what the connection is with the uh, Alden and Ray Raymond Wheeler. Like, are they cousins, Joe? They're cousins, and of course, I think that you, your address is Wheeler Road, is it not? Actually, that's my mother's doing, uh -huh. because uh, Raymond was on the road commissioners when they moved in here, and there was a Wheeler Road was a dirt road, and Raymond was talking to her one day, and she, he said, we're trying to figure what to name the road. And she said, why don't you name a wheel of road? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit, I mean, your childhood, you, you, seem, you must have lived all throughout the world. Did you come back to Concord as a kid for vacations? Or was it just through the stories that your father told that you had a connection to Concord? Uh, we lived mostly in the Washington, D.C. area. In the okay. Suburbs, um, except when uh, when we were overseas. But we, when we were in D.C., we would come up to Concord the last two weeks in August every every year. Uh huh. And uh, unfortunately, I missed the farm 
years. The, the farm on Virginia Road was sold about the time I was born, but um, my grandparents uh, were living in what's now Wright Woods, and we would stay there with uh, in uh, what we called the cottage uh, next to the, the little house that Grandma and Grandpa lived in, and then Aunt Helen was in another house, and Aunt Mary was in another house, and there would be just um, lots and lots of cousins of different ages <laughs> running back and forth. Um, uh -huh. So um, it was an absolutely favorite place for right. us kids. And maybe you or your father could, and I should know this history, and I confess I don't. Can you tell us a little bit more about when they sold the farm and uh, what what is going on in that uh, on that piece of land now where your father was born? That that might be a better question for you, Dad. Well, they they sold the farm in 1953, uh, and uh, <clears throat> at at the time that they sold it. There were a lot of outbuildings and ponds and things. Uh, all that's gone, and it's only the houses left. Uh, and and uh, the, and the farm is completely woods. Uh, mm. It's gone back to nature. Uh -huh. uh, it's not too far from the airport, and uh, it, it, but but there, at this point there are a number of houses on parts mm. of the farm particularly across the street from the house and barns. Uh, it, it, I, one thing, because Concord is constantly changing. <clears throat> and back when my father went into the dairy business, uh, there were two or 3,000 cows in Concord. Uh, today, there's, I don't think there's a single milking cow in the town. <laughs> No. What do you think, Mr. Barrel? Are there any milking cows in Concord? No, not that I know of. Uh -huh. I remember when I was in high school, I went to my first Middlesex County dairy banquet, and it was held in the Concord Armory. It was a dinner banquet meeting, and it filled the Armory with dairy farmers from Middlesex County. Now when they uh, Middlesex County dairy farmers meet, it doesn't fill one round table. And that's and the change in the economy. <laughs> it's so much cheaper to make milk in, in California and places. This yeah. California. Change in transportation. Yeah. Uh, Sue, I wanted to ask you a few more questions about the film. So first, uh, you must have had access to the Wheeler family photos, but uh, did Joe have those, or Rachel, or how, how did you get, or were they in the Concord Free Public Library? Where did, where did you get those, first the Concord-based photos? Right. Well, um, I sourced those photos both from the Special Collections uh, archives, but also Rachel had put together a, a wonderful series of photos for, I, was, I think it was for Joe's 90th birthday, perhaps? Yeah. And... Um, so those were wonderful. And you were asking me earlier before we went online um, about the children, uh, the images of children. And a number of those were from Rachel. And I presume Joe took those pictures. Is, is that oh, right? Yes. Yes. And then um, I, I confess I pilfered from Wikimedia images and from um, uh, the, the other source that I relied on heavily that I think added to the atmosphere of the film is the Gleason Collection and Special Collections, and I felt really um, honored to be able to access that collection. It's very special. Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, it's just beautifully crafted and beautifully done, uh, and the images so movingly complement the audio and the interviews that you um, also did. Thank um, you very much. Sure. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, I'm just interested if, if you had to pick one of your accomplishments, which one would you pick to as the, or the moment in your career that you're proudest of? Oh, my. <clears throat> well, it's a little like asking you which of your children you uh, 
All right, so I don't need to put you on the spot. You can pick one or two, but. I think that uh, I became associated with the United Nations Environment Program, which has its international headquarters in Nairobi, uh, in Kenya. Uh, and uh, being having developed an interest in the environment, uh, that was a very special assignment for me. Great. I was deputy deputy administrator. Uh, the the fact that the United Nations is supported or has been supported to a large extent by the United States means that they like to have maybe a deputy administrator uh, uh, who is an American, and uh, <clears throat> so the, I was picked partly for my experience in USAID and partly uh, uh, by interest in the environment. Well, and then that led to your um, <coughs> work on the Rio summit, right? Yes. Well, I, I, from uh, Nairobi, I went to Paris, where I had a job, which is sort of a coordinator, uh, chair of a committee uh, of the development called the Development Assistance Committee of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which grew out of the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, that gave me a chance to deal with aid agencies across, particularly across Europe and also Japan and Australia. Right. And uh, so I uh, have uh, had re relevant jobs both in the United States and in Europe and in Africa. Uh-huh. Well, we are all in your debt for the important work that you uh, did. Uh, Mr. Verrill, I'm interested in just, you know, Concord has this proud agrarian past, but as the film indicates, you know, so many of those film, so many of those farms are gone now. And, uh, but there are new generations of young people growing up here in Concord. How, how do you, uh, your farm does it in some ways uh, beautifully, but how, how do we help young people have a connection to the land and, and understand where their where food comes from and the importance of kind of protecting the environment and um, again these fertile fields that uh, provide this produce that you so um, ably um, sell at your uh, farm. Well, I think there's more interest in the part of young people now than there was few decades ago. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first uh, came back from Cornell and started farming and I'd hire a few college kids and for the summer and if one of their friends was driving by they'd want to hide behind a tree so they wouldn't be seen working on a farm. That wasn't <laughs> the thing to do then but th that's changed a lot now. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I was quite instrumental was uh, drafting some of the legislation for the uh, 61A program and the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. And both of those make it possible to have farmland afford to, or to be able to own farmland and afford it for agricultural production. Mm -hmm. And uh, the APR program puts it in agriculture permanently, it can't ever be uh, sold for development or non-farm uses. And uh, I, I think that makes it available so there's an opportunity. And Concord has had foresight in uh, promoting preservation a lot of the land through the conservation restrictions. And uh, of course the Concord Land Trust has done a lot. And that much of that land is being farms and productive agriculture now. Um, Rachel, I think you mentioned that you uh, moved back here when you were going to medical school, but you could have lived in any um, of these surrounding communities here in uh, the Boston area. What, what uh, drew you to Concord? What, what, why does Concord continue to have a special place in your heart? Um, well, Concord has always been full of those childhood memories that uh, were counted as some of the happiest uh, memories in our in our family. 
Uh, I also had the opportunity to live just very briefly with my grandmother uh, shortly be before she uh, passed away was when I was about to start medical school. So um, that was just a, uh, a wonderful thing, I think, for both of us to have that time together. And I ended up staying in the town after that. Um, I'll just ask one last question to Sue and then we'll end with Mr. Wheeler. But Sue, uh, one often hears um, the hardest part of making a film is since you're keeping it to an hour, uh, there are portions, I'm sure, of Mr. Wheeler's story and his life that didn't make it into the film. And I thought maybe you could comment on one or two of those. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um I'd say that uh, although this story seems to quietly meander through the past, it was really important that it have a kind of structure, and it really killed me to leave some of these stories out. Joe is a wonderful rock hunter, and um, there's one story in particular I had trouble letting go of. It was about him impulsive, impulsively summiting Mount Washington as a, a teenager one snowy April and getting hell for it. And um, one of the things I most liked about the story was his telling of it, which was, um, it was hilarious. It was very physical. And I think I also liked it because it was a kind of escapade my own kids would have undertaken and probably still would. Um, so I almost kept that story in, um, partly because it demonstrated Joe's sense of adventure and his desire to explore the world. But... Ultimately, it just didn't fit, and I had to jettison it. And it's in instances like this that um, Sam is a wonderful sounding board, and um, sometimes talking to him and helping me clarify why I'm making this, the decisions I am. Um, the only other thing I'd say about what got left out is that I had to make a decision early on about the narrative and decided to focus on Joe's early years and what made him who he is rather than on the details of his professional work and his accomplishments, which are, of course, huge. Um, so planning a second interview with Joe, I knew going into that 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 was going to be the focus of the film. Um, well, that sets me up well for maybe a last question to you, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, when Sue was just talking about you um, climbing, Mount, Kata uh, climbing um, Mount Washington, I was thinking of Henry David Thoreau climbing Katahdin, which you know really was an adventure um, at that time. Uh, and his most recent biographer talks about that moment where he really connects with nature in a way um, he has this line, contact, contact, where he's truly feeling the wind. Um, but it also reminds me of a uh, young John F. Kennedy, who uh, had a certain um, zeal for travel and traveled the world to better understand it and the United States relations with other countries. Um, but again, I think we, in watching the film, we uh, admire your uh, sense of adventure that, uh, again, fueled by like Thoreau, the transcendentalism, uh, as your daughter mentioned in the film, the values of conquered, but then brought you out into the wider world. Um, and uh, I thought we'd give you the last um, words this evening to, again, just, um, you know, I think you said it's partly you're wanting to connect with other people and have those connections. But what, what drove you to, you could have, I'm sure, had a, a quiet life here and and the Concord area, what, what, what drove you to want to travel the world and make a difference the way you did? Well, my, my mother, who took care of decorating the house, uh, went through a process of putting rather plain wallpaper on the bedrooms. Uh, and then she would take posters and, uh, and put two or three posters up. And one of them in my bedroom was called See India. Huh. And that uh, gave me a motivation to, by golly, see India. Wow. <laughs> I've seen a good part of India, but I guess I lived in Pakistan for five or six years, and and uh, 
and, uh, and, and then I was in Nairobi for a couple of years and I had an international experience in Paris. So uh, uh, I've seen the world in many ways. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great world and we Americans need to be uh, associated with it. Uh, interest others in us as we are interested in them. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm struck in hearing you talk that, um, and I was fortunate, I had a Fulbright and lived in uh, Senegal in West Africa for a year. It wasn't the Peace Corps, but it was a similar type of experience. And though in some ways we're connected globally now through, uh, you know, uh, media, uh, there's nothing like actually traveling to another country and living amongst its people and living in a village and, you know, to, to truly understand and recognize that kind of spark of divinity in other people. Um, and once you've done that, it really does affect and change your life and your perspective. Yes, and Concord is a good international town. I think yeah. Koreans are interested in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is very interested in us. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a delightful evening. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank everyone who's been watching, watching the film. Um, if you have questions, more questions for Sue, or I'm sure uh, she would be happy to have other screenings of the film and other venues, so you can uh, contact uh, the museum, and we would be happy to put you in contact with her. Uh, but again, it's a privilege for us and an honor to host this evening. So, uh, Mr. Verrill, thank you for joining us. Uh, Rachel and Joe Wheeler, we're so pleased to have had you here. And Sue, thank you again for this remarkable film that brought us all together tonight. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and have a good night. Good night. Good night.